Hi, and welcome to Maths Appeal. I'm Bobby Seagull. And I'm Susan Okereke. And this is the podcast for you if you're interested in learning more about maths, if you're totally terrified of the subject, or if you're anywhere in between. The Maths Appeal mission is to make maths accessible to everyone. It's something we both feel strongly about as teachers of the subject, and our aim is to show you that not only is maths fun, but it's also everywhere. Every week, Susan and I chat about a particular aspect of maths, sharing our main observations and experiences as both students and teachers, and showing its importance in real life, outside of the classroom. This week, we're looking at fractions and decimals. Then Bobby, who, as I'm sure you're all aware, loves a good brain teaser, will set a puzzle based on that topic. And while you're working it out, we'll hear from our guest. And this week, Susan's chatting to the brilliant maths writer and broadcaster, Alex Bellos. You might know him from his books like Alex's Adventures in Numberland or from his puzzles in The Guardian. And he'll be telling us about his maths journey and how he likes to combine storytelling with maths. After that, back to Bobby's puzzle. We'll go through the answer and our methods of working it out. And you never know, we might throw in some extra math trivia right at the end. Before we get stuck into today's topic, we just want to say thank you for taking the time to download this podcast. (laughs) Yeah, thanks. Yeah. (laughs) This is our third episode in the series. And we really appreciate you supporting to help spread the word. So if you can subscribe, give us a nice rating, follow us on Twitter or Instagram, where at Maths Appeal, or tell your friends about it, that would be great. Right then, let's get stuck into some fractions and decimals. So, can you define a fraction for me, please, Bobby? Definition of a fraction coming right up for you. (laughs) Well, uh, it's a way of expressing a number uh, using whole numbers, but you express it as one component over another. So an example is always illustrated. Let's say two-fifths. Uh, two is the numerator, the top part of the fraction, and there's like a horizontal line, and then five represents the denominator, so two parts out of five. And so for decimals, it's kind of a continuation of our base 10 system. So like we talked about in our podcast one, place value is our numbers after the decimal point. Um, so for example, one tenth, one over 10 is the same as 0.1, one hundredth, which is our second number on the the right of our decimal point, which is 1 over 100, is the same as 0.01. And the same for the next, the third one is 1 over 1,000, which is the same as 0.001. And um, again, it's kind of looking at the relationship between these two things, which are different, but actually the same. Yes, I know. It's the the magic of numbers there. Indeed, (laughs) and then the confusion of them. And so at this part of um, of the podcast, we generally share our ideas as maths teachers and uh, key things we use to do that are three questions and the first question we think about is when we're sort of teaching this top- topic and we think about it for the first time what comes to mind number two uh, we then think about how we teach this topic to our students or how we introduce the idea and number three is what are the common issues that arise when teaching this topic so Fractions and decimals, How? what comes to mind straight away for you, Bobby? I hope this doesn't make you or our listeners hungry, but I think of pizza. <laughs> <laughs> it's maybe the teacher and me, because every time, uh, fractions, time for pizzas. Oh, yeah. Do, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Pizza? Well, I, I don't. I know primary schools, I think they're very good at sort of things like cutting up cake and cutting up actual pizza when they do it. But yeah. um, I kind of stay away from pizza. So you talk me through what you do, and then I'll sort of say, because I quite like using... A rectangle. Yeah. I think, okay. So, sort of my disclaimer is: normally, when I teach fractions, I initially try to just see if they if they sort of have a good grasp on primary school, mm-hmm. and if they already have. I can go straight into using fractions in different ways. You know, um, vulgar fractions, improper <laughs> multiplication, division, all the sort of operations. But if they've one not- minute, just so people understand, vulgar fractions are improper fractions where you've got your numerator, your top number is bigger than your bottom number. Exactly. So when we did two-fifths earlier on, that's mm-hmm. a proper fraction because the numerator is smaller than the denominator. Whereas if it was five over two, which is the same as two and a half, essentially, yeah. that is a vulgar or improper fraction. Yeah. Or top heavy. Yeah. That's yeah, another way. Lo- lots of synonyms. You know, who'd have thought maths appeal and English at the same time? Well, it's like maths and English is everywhere. Exactly. <laughs> um, so I, mean, I think, yeah, obviously I think of pizza, but I think it's, it's all about fluency for me. I think ah, mm. I always try and find out, again, their prior learning. 
did they what did they learn in primary school and if they've got that fluency then i can start introducing more operations but if they've not got that fluency then it's going back to maybe something that you know maybe you can suggest something well yeah so like i think about this topic fractions and decimals and for me it's so massive because it's this whole idea of like an understanding that is kind of an extension of whole numbers, really. And if they kind of um, can get the connection between that, like because you can add and subtract, multiply and divide fractions, as well as decimals, and actually fractions and decimals are just a different way of writing the same thing. And understanding that can kind of make this topic that seems really massive actually quite small. But the foundations of the understanding, in my view, need to be really, 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 really strong. And it's fundamentally a continuation of place value. So how I generally go about it is, one, getting the students to understand the what, say, two-fifths, two-fifths you said, yeah. isn't it? What it means. And the whole idea that you've got I would always generally start off with a rectangle because it's easier to cut these up nicely. Equally, yeah. e- Equally is the key, That's isn't it, true. really? Because, like, you know, pizzas, I love pizza and I like to share it, but it's really hard to... Like to share pizza? It depends on <laughs> depends on with who and by okay. how much. But, yeah, yeah but I, I'm, I like to share. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but with rectangles, when, when you cut them up, you can cut them up evenly and that's very important because the denominator the bottom number tells you how many parts you're cutting up and each of those parts has to be equal and that's like a massive thing that I think can sometimes kind of get lost in the understanding and the top number is effectively how many of those pieces you actually have or that's been selected and knowing that I think is really kind of important and then I kind of like to build in the connection with the whole idea of division because it's you know, fractions are effectively another way of writing division. So two over mm. five is the same as two divided by five. And actually put two divided by five into your calculator, that's 0.4, which is the same as... Four tenths. Or, yeah. yeah, which is the same, same, same as four tenths, yeah. but also is the same as two fifths. Yeah. And this is where it can get so confusing that it's different ways of writing the exact same thing. But when you know it, suddenly there's a whole world of maths open to you and I think it's something that takes a lot of time um, and playing, a lot of playing I think. So that whole looking at decimals and how you can convert from a decimal to a fraction because you know 0.35 imagine is you've got three tenths Mm. and you've got five hundredths Yeah, it's the same as 35 over 100 which you can then kind of cancel down. And so every number can be represented as a fraction quite easily. Yeah, so like the, the, one of the issues, I guess, sort of moving to the next area that I see with my students is that they they can't quite see the equivalency. Like mm. I'll ask them, what is half as a decimal? And some of them are like, oh, but they, they, they sort of resort to the calculator. But they should be able to see half is equivalent to five tenths. 50 hundredths, yeah. which is the same as 0.5 or 50, like almost like bringing money in. Like when I teach decimal sometimes, I try and bring out money because kids can sort of see our uh, 50p, that's how do you write that in terms of pounds, 0.50. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I think the, the, the sort of my common grievance with this is that kids can't quite see half is the same as 0.5. Yeah. and But then it's kind of relating that fact that 0.5 actually is 5 over 10 which can be cancelled to a half. And I think it's it's the fluency of these things that can really make a big difference. And again, I think for the more confident students, they're able to notice relationships like times table wise. So five over ten, you can cancel them cancel it down to a half because five and ten are both in the five times table and then you can simplify it to a half. But if you don't know that, oh, yeah. you then you're then you're stuck and you can't see the relationship of that. And so it's it's the playfulness of that that can kind of open the door to much more complex stuff because if you can change zero point five to five over ten, which you can then cancel down to one over one over two you can then take a number as big as or small as 0.345, put that over a thousand oh, and then cancel yeah. that down and then suddenly you've simplified it into a fraction. And it's the fact that if you can do it with a half, you should be able to kind of do it with anything. Yeah, and I think it just also shows the importance of things like times tables and your basic numeracy. If you've got that, then you can access the higher things. If you haven't got that, yeah. you know how bright you are, it's going to be a challenge. It's a much harder job. Right, that seems like that's a very good place for us to go to Bobby's Puzzle of the Podcast. Yes, so this week it's sort of slightly football themed. So I'm a big fan of uh, Gareth Southgate. And if you've seen any of my talks in public, I like to wear waistcoats. So it's a yes. homage to <laughs> Mr. Waistcoat Man. Um, so here's our puzzle. 
England football manager Gareth Southgate is planning a training session for his England squad. He spends one third of the time practicing penalties. In decimals, he spends 0.5 of the total time on corner kicks. He spends the remaining time of 25 minutes with the team discussing growth mindset strategy. <laughs> How long was the total training session? All right, one more time. I've got half of that information down. One more time for me, Bobby. Yeah, so he's got one third of the time practicing penalty kicks. Mm -hmm. In decimals, 0 0.5 of the time on corner kicks. Mm -hmm. And the rest, 25 minutes on growth mindset strategy. So what was the length of the total session? Brilliant. Okay, so while you're thinking about that, let's hear from the maths writer and broadcaster Alex Bellos. His books include Alex's Adventures in Numberland and Alex Through the Looking Glass, known in the States as His Looking at Euclid and the Grapes of Math. And he welcomed me and producer Jenny into his home a little while ago to share his math story. Over to you, Alex. So my name's Alex Bellos. I am... I guess, an author of maths, of popular math books. My first math book was Alex's Adventures in Numberland. I've done some math colouring books. I've done some puzzle books. I also um, write a math puzzle column in The Guardian every two weeks. When and why did you decide to start writing about mathematics? So I came to this game quite late. Math was my favourite subject at school. It was what I was best at. I studied um, math and philosophy at university. Then I got distracted by journalism, so I became a journalist. And for the best part of 20 years, I was a journalist. I ended up being a foreign correspondent in Brazil, so South America correspondent for The Guardian. But when I came back from foreign climes, I didn't really know what to do. I tried lots of things, and then I sort of thought back to what was my first love, maths. And why don't I try and use these new skills, these kind of foreign correspondence skills, to write about math? <laughs> so I see myself a bit like the foreign correspondent in the world of maths. <laughs> so what was I doing when I was in Brazil? I would go around South America, you know, I spoke the local language, yeah. and I would discover what's going on and communicate it to people who knew nothing about it. Yeah. And I think I'd try and do the same thing for maths. So my audience principally i want to appeal to people who aren't mathsy people mm. i want to go into the world of maths you know i speak the language in the sense that i'm numerate i've got a degree in maths i understand it. i'm not afraid or daunted by it mm. and then i want to just tell good stories about it and even though lots of people who do read my books or read my columns are people who love maths anyway actually what i try and do is not to feel i'm in the maths ghetto and, you know, maths is just interesting for everyone and actually appeal kind of beyond that. So, so what have been some of your um, best responses to your book, so from people who maybe aren't into maths? I mean, the Numberland book now has probably sold around the world 300,000 copies or something. Wow. So that is way beyond the hardcore of maths readers. And I get... You know, I lots of young people saying, I decided to go and study maths at university because I read your book. I get lots of parents saying, I've now read this book and now I still understand. I wish I'd paid more attention when I was at school. Mm -hmm. And I get lots of sort of older people just saying, it's so nice to be refreshed and remember why I really love the subject. And I think that it's a luxury to be able to go back into maths and not be so concerned about having to pass an exam mm. just to look at the things that are interesting mm. and to tell them as stories. Mm. Do, you, do you think there's something missing within the school environment? You know, I get lots of questions from teachers mm. and I am not a teacher. I've not been to teacher college. Mm. I've very few times I've actually taken a maths lesson in school. I mean, I go into schools quite a lot to give talks and, and to enthuse. But it's, it's very hard for me to say, mm. this is how you improve maths, because I don't have that experience. But what I think that I can do is that I am in quite a unique position with this experience of, you know, storytelling, of journalism, mm. that I can engage people maybe in a way that they weren't engaged before. I do this through storytelling. I also do it through 
the picture books, the colouring books. Mm. So the way that happened is that a few years ago, there was a boom in colouring books. And I thought, well, if publishers are falling over themselves to spend money on getting new colouring books, well, well, I can do a colouring book because maths has so many amazing images. Mm -hmm. And also a way in can be, you you might be scared of maths. No one's scared of an image. So you show someone an image and they can take what they want from it. And actually, of all the books that I've done, they're the ones that contain the widest variety of mathematical Mm -hmm. ideas and the deepest ideas. The colouring books have images from a really wide array of mathematical fields from, obviously, Euclidean geometry, but then also, maybe obviously, tessellations, you've Mm -hmm. got fractals, you've got statistical physics, imaginary objects, you've got... Uh, transformations. And these are all things that, but people can who don't know anything about these things can look at them and appreciate the beauty. Oh of yeah, them. they're gorgeous images. They're really striking images. Yeah. It's taking the beauty of mathematics sort of literally, yeah. I guess. And that's sort of interesting because obviously mathematics has a beauty, mm. but it's not a visual aesthetic beauty always. Mm. But when it is, it's sort of more. It's easy for people to understand maybe what the other beauty is so do you see yourself as a um maths cheerleader (laughs) or kind of champion or yeah i guess i do i guess i do i mean i don't really see myself in such sort of heroic terms (laughs) (laughs) particularly (laughs) you know i think that um as a writer what you want to do you want to write and i feel like lucky that here is a whole area essentially Mm. maths that is so full of amazing stuff. Mm. And not that many people, I think, are able to communicate that material to a wide variety of people. You know, there are lots of very good math writers. Often they tend to be, you know, historically, you know, they, they, they might be mathematicians or they might be, um, you know, whatever. But there aren't that many people who are sort of, journalists who write about it in a sort of journalistic way yeah yeah I mean I mean under no illusions that I'm some great mathematician but I think I'm quite a good storyteller and so so then tell us then maybe one of your favorite facts or mysteries with regards to maths that's such an impossible question to answer because it depends who you are and where I am you know when I write my books I have an imaginary reader Mm -hmm. and what you do is that you imagine yourself sitting at a bar with your imaginary reader and you just like turn to them and you tell them a sentence and you basically got to say a sentence that's going to make them interested. And my imaginary reader is someone who like doesn't really, is not really interested by mathematics. So pretty much every sentence that I write, yeah. or especially the introductions to, to get you into it, it's got to be interesting to someone who doesn't, isn't that interested in maths because otherwise you just preaching to the choir. So what's your first sentence of, of your book? Is that too much? <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember. But so my first book, what I wanted to do, my, I can't remember the, the words of the first sentence, but it was all about me meeting this man who had come back from living with a tribe with no numbers. And it's so disorienting living with no numbers that he got the, he thought I was coming on the wrong day. He says he loses track of when he tries to go to work. He just like forgets. And so this is like amazing to think, well, firstly, to think that there are tribes with no numbers. Yeah. Like, how does that work? But also that when you visit them, when you realise when you stop using numbers, you kind of forget how to use them when you come back. So to me, that is interesting to anyone. That's just like amazing. It's amazing. So has your view of maths changed? You know, when you started to do your books, you know, you kind of came as a sort of journalist... And then you thought, oh, you know, I'm going to use my skill for math. In your time, having done that, has your view of maths changed? I don't think my view of maths has changed because how did I view it? I viewed it as this sort of interesting and kind of fascinating and very creative um, language that we use to understand thinking and the world. And that's what I still think. Maybe the older that I get, the more daunting some of it is because it's harder to think, <laughs> especially when you've got young children. Um, 
So whereas before, you know, there might be some new challenge and you kind of think, fantastic, I can't wait to get into this challenge. And now you sort of <laughs> your heart you know, it drops and you think, oh my God. It's a lot. <laughs> that's, a lot of, that's, that's too complicated for me. Um, <laughs> but no, I think that, um, I, think, I think what has happened in the last 30 years, I guess, since when I was like a student and now, is that back then the geeks and the nerds were like really uncool. And now, like, they're kind of cool. They run the world. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe they always ran the world, but now there's a kind of there are enough of them, and it's it's it's, it's sort of they get together. But also, you know, you get a, a movie about Alan Turing or mm. Stephen Hawking or Steve Jobs. It's kind of exciting and cool in a way that you know one of the reasons why I studied maths and philosophy. So at school, I was good at maths. I was best, better at maths than anything else, but I also kind of felt like I needed to do the other things because otherwise I would be completely like with the weirdos. Uh, you know, <laughs> I wanted to be like hanging out with girls as well as, you know, just with the nerds. Whereas I think now you can stay within the nerds and meet girls. I think that's changed. Yeah. I think that's changed. Yeah. The kind of culture around maths. You know, I know a lot of people think, oh my God, it's so bad. You can admit to not being able to count, but you can't admit to not reading. Yes, that is sort of true. Um, so there is a, a bit of a, a kind of a cultural problem with maths. But it's not like it once was. And, you know, everyone wants, every kid wants their phone and wants to get on to Fortnite or whatever. They want to be computer literate. So to yeah. be computer literate, you've got to understand about algorithmic thinking you've got to understand more or less how computers work yeah I, th- I think that's the kind of changed it it's kind of cool to be the geeky one there because you have like knowledge is power oh so thank you alex Bellos, for taking the time to chat to us and for signing my copy of alex's adventures in numberland he recommended another of his books for you bobby puzzle ninja it's a collection of japanese logic puzzles and sounds right up your street i think there's like this brilliantly blue colored book so i i, I think i tried some of these puzzles for my students in ah. school actually yeah firstly i want to say i'm very jealous that you got to interview alex Bellos. it was great <laughs> he's a very funny man actually very very funny man and even in the interview i could sense his power of storytelling because mm. Well, you were discussing things, talking about the appeal of maths. He would bring a narrative. You'd have clever metaphors and ways of bringing the subject to life. You know, this concept of imagine you've got an imaginary reader or an imaginary listener for us. Yeah. And you're trying to make maths engaging because maths is a subject we know that it's got there's so many amazing figures and so many amazing facts and mm. methods and techniques that have changed the way people live. But it's just making sure that we engage people in it so that they think oh actually I'll, I'll listen to your conversation you know, at that bar that imaginary bar the Alex yeah. Bellos bar <laughs> <laughs> Just, I, yeah, I guess that's a challenge of maths because so many yarns and tales but can we make sure that we hook in the listener or for us our students very yeah. quickly I mean was that what you sort of felt from very very much you know it's kind of I think a lot of the time as a math teacher you can get bogged down with the next step and like making sure you cover a certain amount of stuff content wise but actually that whole idea of telling the story and then maybe going to the content if you can engage the kids you know they're motivated and then they're up for learning a bit more about the wonder of it but also it was interesting his talk about the fact that uh, geeks are now cool the geek shall inherit the earth as it said in the <laughs> as it said in the bible <laughs> Indeed, you know, but that's all that, which for me it's really was really great to hear. It was very like positive. It was a really positive outlook on the future. So I think one of the reasons we're doing this is it feels like actually the majority of people we speak to, we talk about maths and it's a real like negative attitude towards it. But it's great that somebody like Alex is putting cool things out there, interesting things out there to get people who would normally say they're not into it, into it, you know, and engaged. And I think... As he says, it's, you know, there are now, you, you can be a geek and, you know, meet boys and girls that you fancy. Amazing. Exactly. <laughs> Math is the best way to meet love. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, why not? Um, but that's the thing. I think it's that thing of, it's hopeful. I think it's great. And if we can, maybe, it's a bit like what Johnny Ball said in the earlier podcast, you know, podcast one and two. Mm where he talked about the idea of making math accessible and making it engaging to people. And, you know, this whole idea of, of, of stories and starting from there as opposed to just, like, the, the number element of it. So let's go back to the puzzle, Bobby. Can you remind us of the question? And then let's go through the answers. 
So we had England football manager Gareth Southgate. He's planning a training session for the squad and he spends one third of the time practicing penalties and then a decimal 0.5 of the time on corner kicks and the remaining time, 25 minutes, discussing growth mindset. Um, so what was the total length of the training session? So the way I went about this, do you know much about bar models? I've seen some watching primary school teachers, actually. OK, well, so I that's a, I love them but I'm also learning how to use them myself because again I've learned them from uh, primary school teachers again I'll share my my methods uh, on Instagram at Matt Appeal but the way I kind of did it was I drew a bar split it into a half and into a third and then split those into sixths because those come multiple of th- three and two is six so I can fit into a half, three sixths, because a half is the same as three sixths. Mm-hmm. And then a third is the same as two sixths. Put them all together, total of five sixths. That means the section on the end that we we didn't know, the 25 minutes, that actually equated to a sixth. So 25 minutes is a sixth of the total time, which tells us then that two sixths, which is our corner kicks, is 50 minutes. And then a half or three sixths of our penalties is 75 minutes or one hour and 15 and then our total is two hours and 30 minutes perfect full marks and, and, and again I love the bar the bar method bar, bar modelling yeah. yeah how did you do it? So I just went straight for the fractions okay um, so again I just put half plus a third common denominator of the two numbers two and three is six so the top became three six plus two sixths equals five sixths uh, then I said one six is remaining over, which is 25 minutes, and just straight up multiply that by six to give us 150. So you did the whole, like, effectively the algorithm of convert, adding fractions where you make the denominators the same, yeah. and then from there, okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's pretty much the same thing, but I suppose the visual part, the I think, is really bit. kind of helpful for people who are not quite sure of what's kind of going exactly. on. Exactly, especially if you're fluency, if you feel as if you want to explain it really clearly, the visual just makes it 100% clear that you're on the mm-hmm. right track. I've even seen someone attempt this with a pie chart. Oh, like then, like splitting up a pie chart into one third and then half of the pie chart and then seeing that's 25. You've got to be very careful with your angles, yeah, haven't you? Yeah, you've got to be careful. Um, I would say the bar is probably better than the pie chart. So that's it from us. If you fancy subscribing, telling your mates to subscribe or giving us a five-star rating, that would be amazing. Uh, you can also find us on Twitter and Instagram. We're at Maths Appeal. Come and say hi and tell us what you thought of my puzzle. In next week's podcast, our guest is Danielle Newnham, the co-founder of F Equals, an organisation designed to inspire, motivate and empower women. Danielle's written books include Female Innovators at Work, Women on Top of Tech. And I'm really looking forward to finding out more about that, as hopefully we can help promote women and girls studying STEM subjects, that's science, technology, engineering and maths, which is very close to the heart of maths appeal. Very much, very much. This is so important to get more girls involved in STEM. It's something that's a real issue, I think, actually, in our country. So it'd be great to hear what Daniel has to say about that. And to end, Bobby, do you have a math fact for us? Yes. Um, fractions and decimals. So again, this is something that didn't make the cut for my book. So we're getting all the sort of hot releases. The, the B-sides. The, the B-sides, yeah. <laughs> the C-sides. Well, you know in fractions, we've got that line, that horizontal line that separates the numerator, the top part and the denominator. Yes, I do. There's a word for that line. Are you serious? Yeah. It's called a vinculum. V- V-I-N-C-U-L-U-M. That's, it's from the Latin word meaning bond or chain or to tie. So that horizontal wow. line or bar in maths that we see in fractions uh, is called a vinculum. Sounds like a part of the body. It does. That's wonderful <laughs> information. And that on that, we're going to have to say goodbye. We've been uh, Susan Okereke and Bobby Seagull on the Matt Appeal podcast. The music was composed by Kelly Okereke. The image design is by Calix Davis. And our producer is the wonderful Jenny Nelson. Mm-hmm.